Hi, my name's Charlie Thorburn. Welcome to Mordor Gun Dogs. We've got another delightful, wet, foggy, drich morning up here in Scotland. So we are going to do a little video on kit. People have asked me about what should we get for training our dog. Now, I am definitely a fan of less is more, partly because I'm an inherently mean Scot. I don't like spending money. And also, I think you can get just a bit carried away by having, and you end up with one of those people with all the gear and no idea. Not a good move. So where do we start? The most important thing in our training to start with is, is lead work. So we use a slip lead. Now we talked about leads in a different, showed different types of lead, but this is basically what we use. It's quite a thin rope slip lead. They're about a, a meter 20 long, I think. You can use a shorter one if you've got a bigger dog or you're shorter. You just have to figure out which one's gonna suit you best. The most important thing when you buy a lead is that it's got no stretch, okay? Every effort that goes in on my right hand comes through to my left hand because there is no, it's not a climbing rope. It doesn't go doing and expand and then retract. Because the problem with a lead that expands and retracts or is elasticated is that a lot, all the effort you put in to correct your dog, so that tug you give them doesn't actually really reach the dog because it's absorbed in the lead, which kind of acts like a shock absorber. So why do we use a slip lead? We use a slip lead because I think they work the best. None of our dogs wear collars. The reason they don't wear collars is because it's working dogs and living in the farm in the middle of nowhere. We don't want them to get caught up in undergrowth, etc. There is no problem with a collar at all though. There's no problem with a collar and a lead. We just have this one size fits all. It wraps up and it goes into my pocket nice and neatly. I tend to use brighter colors because I drop them uh, and also some of my team are really prone to stealing dog leads off me. So if I have a very clearly distinct color of dog lead, then there's no confusion that that one belongs to the boss and then they can fight over the rest of them. Next, the whistle. I always have one around my neck. This, I use an Acme 2 11 and a half. Some of my, some of my team for Spaniels, they use a 2 10 and a half. People use silent ones. And then we have the uh, Mordor gun dogs lanyard to hook it onto, okay? Now, why do we use a whistle? The reason we use a whistle is because disturbs game less than, come here, come on. When we're trying to, we're trying to keep the game settled and quiet, and we're also trying to be as, as unobnoxious as possible. So if I'm walking through a park, or walking across a hill, or walking through a field, or walking down a road, and I can just say, to get my dog to come back, rather than going, sausage, sausage, come here, sausage. You know, then it's just, it's just a more pleasant experience for me and it's a more pleasant experience for everyone else. Why, people say, why don't you just whistle through your teeth? I can do that, but not everyone I train dogs for can do that. And on a freezing cold, 50 mile an hour, bitterly cold wind with sleep driving into your face, try whistling. You can't even get your lips together because you're so cold. Whereas you can always get your whistle out and use that. Now, blowing a whistle, short and sharp. You put your tongue over the end of the whistle, okay? And you lift your tongue to control it. You don't go because it doesn't work so well. We want that sharp, crisp note, okay? So that the dogs very clearly hear it. And there's no confusion and it's the same every time. Practice you blowing your whistle when you're not with your dog, okay? Until you've got it mastered and then start using it with your dog. We'll talk about introducing a whistle to a dog in, a, in another video. Then we've got the key tool. We have one of these in our, all of my team basically have one of these in, my, in their pocket all the time. I have the same problem with these and I need to write Charlie on one of them because they go missing. People drop them in fields and don't find them again and then they go to my pockets and they steal them. But a tennis ball, we've got lots of them. We, we, uh, when we run out, we go for a walk in a park or around some tennis courts with a load of dogs and we suddenly have a te Tesco bag full of them again and we're good to go. So we use these all the time for lots of our, lots of our training. I met a guy once who, who had a, a field trial winning uh, Springer Spaniel, I think, and he said that he did all of his training with a tennis ball. And the first time his dog saw game was on the trial. He'd done everything from basic retrieving and steadiness as a puppy to throwing it viciously across the grass in front of the dog to simulate, to simulate a rabbit running or a pheasant flying. So these are great and they're cheap if not free. So these are, these are fab. Then the standard, I think they're one pound. I think the standard one pound training dummy. Color is kind of irrelevant. Uh, again, we use, you know, a few different colors just to make it more interesting. But you know, usually they used to all be cam, they used to be green. They're just canvas. They're filled with a sort of sand sawdust mixed mix. 
and you get the toggle and you can get pretty good at throwing them. You don't need loads of these. You don't need loads of different sizes. People buy puppy ones. Yeah, that's fine. If you want to buy a puppy one, go for it. We just, puppies just use a tennis ball. The reason we use a dummy is because it helps teach the dog to carry it a, a bit of game correctly, rather than like that or like that. We want them to hold it in the middle. Sometimes we have to cut the toggle off because young dogs will kind of carry it like that, which isn't really what we want. We want a nice, firm, 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 but not hard grip of the dummy in the middle. And then the idea is when the dog brings us the dummy, as we put our hand on it, they let go. We don't want them dropping it, and we certainly don't want to have a fight with it, okay? And these are just great things. They go in the water. If you get really wet, they'll sink, but, if it, but, but generally we can do a few water retrieves. They're pretty robust. And um, yeah, they're pretty easily available as well. We also use, um, we use a paint roller quite a lot. It's a bit lighter. We use a, pu a smaller one for the puppies and that one for older dogs. Just cheap and easy to get hold of. Again, my inherently mean Scottishness. It's just pretty handy. You can get these really easily. If one gets destroyed or lost, it doesn't really matter. Now, moving on, slightly more complicated bits of kit. Tennis racket, very complicated. It's just means you can send these further. Okay, it's just for longer retrieves. Quite fun going out into the field and pelting tennis balls for a dog, setting them, pelting them into the distance and sending them off for them. Okay, you know, you don't need to take up tennis to go and buy a tennis racket, but if you've got a tennis racket, it can be a, it can be a handy little addition to your, to your training. Um, this is like a plasticky, rubbery dummy. This is a water dummy. So, you know, it's never going to sink. Uh, we're never going to, it, it's not going to rot. So these are what we use in water all the time. Um, I actually have some dogs that mess around with the canvas ones and they pick these rather better. So I'll, sometimes I'll use these in land. We just kind of tend to use what, what works best for the dog. Uh, once they're really good at retrieving, we want them to retrieve everything from tennis balls to dummies to plastic dummies to plastic bottles and sticks and anything we throw. Even if I throw my hat, I want the dog to go and get it. But, you know, we, we obviously have lots of dogs to train, so we need pretty robust bits of kit. And this is this has seen the rounds. This has been kicking around here for about 15 years and it, it's still going strong. So, again, that appear, ap appeals to my uh, my um, cobweb wallet nature. Then if we get really if we've got some sort of specialist dogs, difficult dogs, this is what we call a training line. OK, it is about 15 feet and we clip it onto the dog's collar or or round, or just loop it around their neck. And this is a dog that we, uh, this is for a dog that we don't have full control of and we feel like it might run away. And what we do is we can just stand on the end of it. It's not, it's not like an extendable lead. We're not holding on to it. We're just letting them trail it along behind them. But I, I've been asked to do a video on one of the, on using one of these. So we'll do one of these at a later date. The key with a training line is it's quite light. It slips through the grass easily. What you don't want is something that gets tangled around a bush and the dog's sort of tugging at it and stuff. We want it just to be able to, slip through the grass. And again, this has got a sort of plasticky rubber outer layer. Um, so it can, you can grip it, you can stand on it and get a bit of grip. When I was, um, when I was uh, younger and I really didn't have any money, I used, to, um, I used to use a washing line, but you know, I've gone up in the world. So now I pay 15 pounds for one of these instead. And then probably the most fancy bit of kit we use, this is a dummy launcher. Now ours has a, has a butt extension because you put it at your shoulder, you fire it. Some of these dummy launchers, you can really hurt your thumbs and your wrists if you don't use them properly. But look, you know, you really don't need, to train your gun dog to a reasonable standard, you really don't need one of these. This is just the dummy that goes with it, slots over the end, it fires a blank shot. We use this, you know, a reasonable amount, but we're training a lot of dogs. It's certainly not a requirement. They're quite expensive. I think they're probably, 150 quid or something like that and we get through these we break them because we use them a lot but we break them because we use them a lot but uh you know it's the sort of thing you buy and then you might end up just sitting it on the shelf you're probably better off just asking someone who might have one uh borrowing it for the few months that you need it when your dog's uh at that stage of training and then passing it back or handing it to the next person so really there's not much okay we've got dummies we've got tennis balls we've got a tennis racket we don't need loads of stuff. You don't need loads of remote control gizmos and gadgets. I mean, great. If you want to get them, I'm sure they're helpful. But what I found is that the, the novelty of them wears off and the dog gets the hang of them. Someone showed me once a thing that dropped tennis balls out of a tree. Uh, and all that happens is you use it a couple of times and then the dog learns, oh, there's a, that, when that machine goes click, click, it drops a tennis ball and it knows exactly what's going on and it figures it out. We're trying to simulate the real thing, okay? None of these things look like a pheasant. 
none of them uh, look like a yeah you know, i mean that sort of looks like a gun but i mean basically we're just trying to train the dog in theory so we don't need to get carried away with all these bits of kit that make it look like it's the real deal because when it's the real deal hopefully our dog's good enough and we're we're taking them out to um to to to, to work them because the training's gone to plan and of course the last thing we need is a dog sausage so this this is sausage oh be gum sausage now for those of you who have not met sausage before sausage is waffles mummy so she has a very famous child don't you sausage and sausage belongs to my nine-year-old son freddie who's just there desperately keen to get into the uh, the filming so you need a dog you need a whistle you need a lead a couple of retrieving tools and you're away and if you want to get if you want to advance your training get some more bits of kit but really don't get carried away i can't tell you where to get any of this stuff particularly we don't have a sort of we don't have an affiliation with anyone i'm not going to say some someone's kit's better than others but I, what i would say is you, you do generally get what you pay for if you buy cheap stuff it'll break if you buy decent stuff it'll last longer i hope this is I hope this has been helpful and uh, enjoy your enjoy your training and enjoy your shopping remember you get out what you put in thanks for watching and like and subscribe.